Hello to everyone joining us um, for this Zoom webinar. We will be starting in a couple of minutes. Um, please allow some more attendees to join us and we'll begin shortly. Right. Very good afternoon to all and a very warm welcome to the talk Off the Walls, which is the fourth talk of C Spotlight. And this is a specially curated series of panel discussions and talks that are organized as part of C Focus 2021. Before we begin, please be informed that there will be a dedicated time of Q&A towards the end of the discussion. And you are very much encouraged to leave comments and questions in the Q&A function of this Zoom webinar. And you can find that located at the bottom bar of this platform anytime during the talk. Please allow me to quickly introduce and welcome our panelists this afternoon. We have Jeanette Chittick, visual artist and program leader of the Diploma in Creative Direction for Fashion at LaSalle College of the Arts. We have art collector Michelangelo Sampson and Jackson Tan, artist, designer, and founding partner of the collective Funk. This panel will be moderated by Tracy Phillips, director of P Purpose. Welcome. It is a big pleasure to have all of you as part of today's discussion. Thank you. Bob. I'll now hand the time over to Tracy, who will introduce and begin the panel. Over to you, Tracy. Tracy, I believe you're muted. The Zoom 101. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, would love to set the tone uh, to keep this really casual and spirited. I'm actually quite excited uh, to see what questions um, uh, some of the audience might have later on. Um, but I thought first, uh, to get everyone on the same page, um, that it would be great to hear from our panelists just to kind of understand a bit more about how they came to be doing uh, what they do. I think we all love a good uh, origin story. Um, and uh, I think we'll start off with, with Jeanette, uh, followed by Jackson and then Michael. So yeah, um, I will give everyone like five minutes just to, to give us a little bit of an intro. Jeanette. Right, take it away. <laughs> Thanks for having me, uh, C Focus. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm going to talk a bit about my background, shed some light and how my punk rock roots um, drive the DIY ethos that runs very deep in my various practices of design, art, fashion, and music, and DJing and weaving. Next, please. Okay. I formed the first uh, local all girl band and we were punk rockers and this was back in the 90s. This really tells you how old I am. So I was um, like uh, 16, 15 years old and we really didn't know how to play our instruments well, but we wrote great uh, songs and but we also face uh, really incredible sexism in the scene and on stage. And uh, that was precisely uh, the impetus uh, for seeking out something else that would put a name to what I was feeling. It was then that I discovered Riot Girl Movement of uh, Olympia, Washington, USA. Um, these girls started the movement because they felt very sidelined, uh, trivialized and devalued in the underground scene. Um, and this scene uh, had purported to champion the different and was, uh, um, and, uh, was generally egalitarian. Um, so besides making my own punk music, my teenage self felt that I, um, it was imperative that I had to create my own narrative um, because there was very little or there was no uh, local representation of girls in the local punk scene. So these voices that were very apparent were largely male um, in the hegemonic hierarchy of a male-dominated music scene. Next, please. So um, the DIY ethos of the punk community is totally um, anti-consumerist. Um, I was very enthralled by, um, by that and I couldn't find any publications locally that spoke to my experiences as a girl in the scene. Uh, so I had 
to make my own stuff to sell. I started a zine and it was titled Cherry Bomb Press. I printed my own uh, silkscreen t-shirts and organized all girl gigs so that I could hold space for other girls uh, in the same situation. And I also started um, a lo local Riot Girl chapter. Um, all of this really just so that I could have material that would resonate with my views and uh, lived experiences and to, dis uh, to encourage discourse. Um, I knew nothing, oh, sorry, back please, <laughs> the previous slide, yeah. Um, I knew nothing about um, doing any of these things like the other punks, but you know, if other people could do it, I could too. And this really was the spirit of the punk community. And this is the cut up um, and paste aesthetic, as you can see here of the local Riot Girl, uh, sorry, of the Riot Girl scene. And it really looks like the bastard child of the 70s and 80s punk zine and the teenage girl with a third wave feminist point of view. Um, these were my visual references and I explored image and uh, image making while creating my own scene. And with this, for the first time, I felt I had a voice um, that I could amplify in an impactful way. So there's something really visceral about this kind of style of visual communicating, uh, visual communication that really aligns itself with um, Riot Girl um, and punk rock energy. And this texturality really figures a lot in, the, in my work in different ways. Next, please. This is an animated logotype of a vinyl re-release for our punk EP. Um, as you can see, we use um, all uh, photocopy dirt and uh, traditional cut up and paste methods uh, transposed into a contemporary digital medium. Next, please. A lot of my work from the earlier zine days do not exist anymore because I, I was very happy to sell all of my zines that proved that I was a success, um, you know, so, <laughs> but here is some typographic explorations later on that were influenced by my punk rock roots and riot girl roots. Um, next, please. Um, yeah, so this was a zine that I collaborated on with my friend Pei Shan. Next. Um, soon after, I decided to uh, start uh, a fashion label, even though I wasn't trained in fashion, but I thought, you know, if other people can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> so then, you know, with, with, with sheer uh, ignorance, I went into it headlong and I started a label called Fufu and Tiger Lily with some friends. And uh, you can see here, um, the materials and um, the finishings used are still very grounded in punk rock and uh, rock and roll visual language like slits, cuts and unfinished leather, PVC and snake skin. Um, next please. And then later I started to participate in group shows and I ventured into sculptural object based work and moved into working with materials that are not so in my vernacular such as wood and vinyl, even though I listen to vinyl but you know I don't use it as a material. <laughs> next. Um, and, you know, uh, I also dive later headlong into tapestry weaving. I took a very short course right before I got pregnant, uh, before I gave birth, actually, and decided that, yeah, this is for me. And, you know, I managed to get myself into a festival, the Light to Night Festival at National Gallery in 2017. And this was a woven response to Georgette Chen's Lotus in a Breeze. Um, and also, at the same time, I started hand spinning my own yarn from Moreno wool and self-harvested uh, local cup of cotton. So you can see on the top right that was um, that is a couple um, um, raw couple there. Okay, next please. So um, in my recent work, um, the themes explored are of unseen labor of women, the aesthetics of care, and also you know investigating and situating my practice in the intersection of design, art, and craft to amplify the unseen and validate it and devalue it in contemporary art. Uh, the common thread from when I was a punk to present day is really about amplifying the unseen and the devalued. So you can see here a clear lineage of my design influence. I was very interested in Bauhausian design principles. I teach that while I'm in school um, uh, at LaSalle. And also, you know, the Memphis design group's work speaks to me and touches my soul. So you can see here on the left four pictures um, are my visual influences and on the right, uh, my um, uh, explorations, uh, my first object-based explorations with regards to my influences. Next, please. So um, the outcomes were these, these assemblages, and they were showed at uh, Ultra Super New Gallery in um, a two-woman show called uh, Planes and Envelopes. Next, please. And this one was my solo called This That um, um, at uh, just a few months later at uh, the Loai Arts Club. Next, please. And this is my latest body of work. 
and uh, the pieces really came off the wall, so to speak, uh, made of of, cut, uh, of cuts and wood waste. All right, thank you. Great. Um, next up, we have uh, Jackson. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackson. Um, well, while they're loading the slides, uh, I'm just going to make a quick introduction and origin stories of Funk. So Funk is an art and design collective. Uh, we started in 1994. Uh, we're a bunch of four homegrown boys. Uh, we met in LaSalle College of the Arts. We studied in design. Um, we shared the love, same love for you know, things like uh, British uh, indie pop music, American street culture, uh, Japanese anime, uh, Hong Kong Kung Fu movies, and Chinese mythology. Uh, well, much like uh, Jeanette, we considered starting a band and then we went to, to, to the studio to jam and realized that you know, most of us can't really play instruments to save our lives. So, so we exchanged the electric guitar for a Mac, you know, and then we experimented with it and we started to create uh, visual works. And it evolved from, you know, from stickers to posters to t-shirts to zines to animations to now, you know, we do sculptures, uh, prints and uh, installations. So yeah, next. <laughs> So yeah, I think the band is basically uh, Elvin, William, uh, Melvin, and myself, Jackson. And this is a, a drawing of the four of us as Kiss. Uh, we're never a, a fan of Kiss, but we always love how they so-called uh, visually represent themselves on their faces. So the four of them are a band, you know, you can see that. Uh, but yet all four of them have different personalities drawn on their faces. And that's very much how Funk is. All four of us work as a band, uh, but all four of us are different personalities. And, uh, you know, we, we very much work and function more like a band, uh, a visual band, compared to a conventional design or art studio. And we still sign our, our works as funk. So all of us practice the same signature and we sign it as funk. Yeah, next. So, well, besides calling ourselves a visual band, we are also so-called big time like visual junkies. So we love collecting visual junks. Yeah, so next. Uh, yeah, so this is a picture that you see that is uh, things that is in our studio. So our studio is like our junk yard of collectibles. So it's filled with, you know, many things, you know, you can see like uh, vinyl records, uh, comic books, a lot of Nike sneakers, uh, you know, um, sci-fi, uh, uh, novels, uh, a lot of t-shirts, you know, that we never ever wear for many years. Uh, it's still there in our studio. So it's really like a huge junk yard. Uh, but it also inspired us in shaping our visual language and our artistic voice, you know, all this stuff. And we feel that all this junk are really art and essential to us in funk. Uh, it's very much the so-called the nutrients of funk. Uh, next. So um, today I'm, I'm gonna talk a bit about Control Chaos uh, and it's a seminal artwork for funk. Yeah, next. Yeah. So in, uh, in the early 2000, 2003, uh, we were invited to, to exhibit at the Reed Space at the Lower East Side of New York. Uh, and that was our first solo exhibition uh, outside of Singapore. And that was also the time just post September 11 and it was during SARS, uh, you know, the world is very badly affected. Um, we thought to ourselves, what should we create um, for that New York show? And we thought that we should bring something from Singapore to New York. Uh, and, we and we were inspired by our childhood memories of, you know, visiting Hopa Villa, um, and, you know, the favorite part of Hopa Villa for us was the, you know, the 18 chambers of hell, where, you know, in the Chinese mythology, if you, if you make a scene when you are living, when you are dead, you'll be judged and then you, you'll be punished for it. Yeah. So we were very fascinated with it and we decided to bring Hopa Villa to New York. And if you see this, it's a piece of work that has 12 so-called panels and each panel is like a chapter of control chaos telling a small story. Uh, so from the heaven to earth to hell, um, and you can even see Funk, the four of us in the kids' outfits in hell, uh, having a party. Yeah. So uh, we were asking ourselves, why was the world in chaos? You know, maybe the, the gods were not doing their jobs, people are protesting, and then you know, people are having parties in hell. Um, yeah, I think what was interesting about uh, control, control Chaos was that we were very limited in so-called production techniques. The only thing that we knew besides drawing and uh, using computer was uh, suit screening from our experience of suit screening t-shirts. Uh, we just decided to use that uh, technique uh, to make control chaos. So we drew the stuff and then we still screen it on corrugated boxes. And uh, why we did that is because uh, that was the only thing that we could afford. And uh, we didn't have to ship the work to New York because that would cost too much. We could ship ourselves to New York to party. Yeah, so we basically hand, hand carried the, the works and then went on plane and, and went to New York. 
uh, what was surprising is that we, we received a lot of very good response to it. And on the first night itself, uh, all the works were sold. And we were selling them in individual pieces and they were all sold. So we kept a full set for ourselves. Um, but what's interesting is that in 2002, um, you know, uh, 2012, um, there was a warehouse fire while we were moving our studio and all the pieces of uh, works in our studio was burned, including Control Chaos. And um, early last year, M Plus Museum in Hong Kong uh, contacted us and they were very interested to um, collect Control Chaos. And it was really interesting uh, for us to reprint Control Chaos and also to note that the artwork now somehow has some kind of relevance again that we look at it uh, in the time where we have yellow umbrella uh, movement in Hong Kong, COVID and the turmoil that's around the world. So this year, uh, besides reprinting Control Chaos, we also created an updated uh, animated piece of Control Chaos. Um, and you can see the reprinted uh, Control Chaos piece at uh, C-Focus uh, and the latest 2020 version, which is uh, animated, will be presented in M+. Uh, at their opening exhibition later this year. So we have also, you know, centered Fung's uh, 25 years uh, retrospective show and a book based on control chaos. Um, and I think it's very interesting that how uh, we can come back and look at this piece of work and update it again. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Jackson. And now we have our lone collector on the panel, uh, Mike, uh, to, to share a bit more. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm the lone collector. So hopefully, um, give give everyone a, a different perspective. Rachel, I'm not able to see the the scroll of the slide, so I'll call out the slide title as well, just to make sure we're on the right slide. Yeah. So origin. Um, so every superhero story begins with an origin, and here we have Amazing Fantasy 15 from 1962 which is actually the origin of Spider-Man. Everyone knows the story. A boy gets bitten by a radioactive spider and turns into a superhero. And in my case, I was bitten by the collecting bug at 10 years old. And uh, um, I've been collecting, I've been a collector ever since, but having a, having a collection at the early age, collection of comic books, gave me the disciplines, uh, serial acquisition, uh, care, custodianship that I think prepared me for uh, uh, collecting contemporary art. So I think I'll tackle our topic today off the walls from three dimensions uh, through our collection. The first is a geographic lens. We started as a Philippine contemporary collection. We grew into Singapore and now we're a Southeast Asian collection. Second is from themes. Collectors always start with the personal themes and then they grow on to the bigger themes, culture, history, religion, and so on. And the third, and probably most interestingly, as we go through the slides is, um, you know, material, the lens of material going from oil and canvas to more exotic materials. And I think that transition from oil to an exotic material is exemplified here on this slide by Eko Nogroho, who is a painter from Indonesia. Eko transitioned his practice from painting into actual, uh, actually sculpture and then embroidery. So this is the tapestry illusion of hope where Echo not just transitions oil to thread, but also his own practice from being an individual painter to engaging a whole community of embroiderers. And actually now in the institution, institutional scene, Echo is much more known for his tapestries than his paintings. Next slide, please, on transmission. So transmission, what do I mean by that? Artists are transmitters of culture, you know, uh, and collectors are their receivers. So the artist broadcasts on a certain frequency and there is one collector who gets that frequency and there is contact. So I liken it to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, radio telescopes, looking at the night sky, waiting for a signal, waiting for a message. And, uh, you know, in this work here, it's 5959 by Corinne de San Jose from the Philippines. Uh, this, Corinne assembled basically 118 transistor radios into which she is broadcasting a recording of field crickets. So apart from being an artist, Corinne is also a sound engineer. And the hardest thing to achieve in film is silence, the sound of silence. There is always ambient noise when you're filming, right? And when you film outdoors, that ambient noise is actually the sound of crickets. Um, for her, for Corinne, this sound is the sound of nostalgia. It's the sound of her childhood. It's, it's the sound of playing outside at dusk 
and then being called in back into your home. For me as a collector, uh, the metaphor of this background sound, I, I think it's like the artistic energy. It's the frequency that artists are broadcasting and it's always there if you choose to listen. Next slide, please, Rachel. Um, so relics, performance-based work is one of the hardest things to collect. You know, how do you bottle a performance? How do you collect that? And especially durational performance, just like what we have here, uh, I am a ghost in my own house. It's a 12-hour durational perform performance by Melati Suryodharmo from Indonesia. And in this performance, she basically grinds coal using a heavy mortar over 12 hours with no break until she is she drops down exhausted. And actually the, the audience itself is invited to come in and out of the performance and she's still there. And her white dress starts pristine and white and it becomes completely blackened. So it's, it's about energy, it's about the creative force, it's about expand, expanding yourself and it's about mortality. How do you collect something like this, right? And I think that the best analogy is through um, the religious arena where we have the concept of reliquaries. Reliquaries contain bones of a saint or fragments of the vestments of a saint. They are not the same. Just this, by the same token, uh, a performance can be recorded through the relics of the performance, the dress, the video recording of that performance. And that is what the collector can collect. Uh, is that the performance? No, uh, but just as a reliquary can sometimes be ven as venerated as a saint, the relics from a performance can also attain its own artistic integrity. Uh, next slide, please. Codex. Why do I say codex? Um, so much of contemporary art can actually be opaque to the man on the street. You know, people don't get it. They say, well, what is this? And actually contemporary art, if you have the key uh, to unlock it, you can actually uh, it can shake, your, it can shake your, your soul just as a normal painting could. So here we have the Codex Gigas and the Codex Gigas is the largest illuminated manuscript that we have. Uh, and it is uh, 850 years old. But the interesting thing about this Bible is that it contains, uh, it starts with six alphabets two Hebrew, one Greek, one Latin, one French, and one German. In short, the monks who made this, they really want you to understand the Bible, regardless of your, of your language. In the work that I have here, the sun will rise in the east and deliver us from this long night. The artist Yi Ilan from Malaysia takes a passage from the Quran and uses it as a lens to discuss politics in Malaysia. Saba, where Ilan is from, is actually in the east of Malaysia. It represents 40% of the land mass of the country, but has no representation in parliament. And so just as the sun rises in the east, the hope of Ilan is it will rise in the east of Malaysia on Saba as well. So this work can be read like a sentence. The artist digitally manipulated pictures of uh, people saying goodbye to each other at airports and train stations removing faces and bodies and leaving only their arms. And the arms can be read like letters, you know, and, and you can see from the close-ups here. Uh, so the, the, the photographs actually correspond to the letters of the title, the sun will rise in the east and deliver us from this long night. So this is also poetic in the sense that the, uh, Elan is basically saying to solve these types of problems, you have to engage, you have to embrace. Uh, next slide, please. Fables. Yeah, in our collection, we have a lot of storytellers, and one of them is Geraldine Javier from the Philippines. She is a painter, but she made this work, Red Fights Back, to talk about gender issues. She used the fable of Red Riding Hood to, to talk about gender issues. And Geraldine is a painter, but in this work, she made embroidery, she made performance, she made she used theater, and she documented it with, with in through photography. And I think when you try and collect an artist in depth, and that's something we try to do, we try to collect artists in depth. Uh, when an artist is trying to evolve and trying to grow into a different uh, you know, aspect of their practice, the job of a collector is to follow, you know, this followership, to listen and, and uh, uh, to pursue so that the artist always has this audience that goes with them. Next slide, please. River. 
So this very strange device that you see here is, is uh, the clock of the long now, or as it's sometimes called the 10,000 year clock. And it tells time on a different scale. It tells time on the scale of our species. The, the, minute, the second hand is a year, the minute hand is a century, and the hour hand is a millennium. And it's meant to go on even after we are gone. It requires no maintenance and it just runs. And uh, the clock is meant basically to outlast us, right? In the work on and on that we have here, the artist He Man Chong from Singapore is basically challenging the notions of collecting and ownership. Here, the artist basically gives you this artwork, right? That's the start of the artwork. And after a year, the collector is supposed to give that artwork and pass it on and on and on, like time, like a river. So the temptation, of course, for every collector like myself is just to keep the artwork, right? And to, to keep this precious object. The problem is that if you do that, you are breaking the artistic intent and the circuit. And therefore, can you still call this an artwork? Will these works that Heman has given out be passed on? Time will tell, time will tell. Next slide, please. Uh, so dialogue, um, someone asked me this question. Uh, when, when your collection grows in size, there are ine inevitable conversations that emerge. So on the left here is Flight by Alfredo and Isabel Achillesen from the Philippines. They, the Achillesens work with communities. In this, in this case, they worked with a community for a river cleaning project, and they fished out so many discarded slippers, lost and discarded slippers, which they then formed into wings. Uh, here. And these wings are meant to talk about migration. They're meant to talk about the Philippine diaspora. Uh, the work on the right is Sandals United by Anki Porbandono from Indonesia. So Anki is a photographer, but he doesn't use a camera. He uses a scanner. And for a year, he spent some time in jail. I won't say why he spent some time in jail, but he asked the warden if he could bring the scanner into, into the prison. And in effect, he recorded his time in prison. And in fact, he became a teacher in the prison workshop. So the Slippers United work that you have here is a record of his cell block. These are his neighbors. These are the slippers of his neighbors in the cell block. And you can see that they are individually marked and there are markings that people make on their slippers. So even in this dehumanizing setting, there is this overwhelming human desire for individuality, for in intimacy, to be recognized and to feel human. So we, that's why we, we really like the juxtaposition of these two works. Uh, next slide, please. Architecture. So as a collector, and many collectors who are on this panel will identify with this, you know that a work is special when you can't resist it, even though you promised yourself you're not gonna buy anymore. So during the circuit breaker, we said, look, let's, these are tough times, let's not buy anything. And yet this work from, by Faris Nakamura, from now on of, of Singapore, from now on, you will not be alone, came up. And Faris is basically using the language of architecture to talk about the pandemic. This is a model of a migrant workers dormitory, but uh, he blacked out the windows uh, to show the isolation. And he, in this way, he's trying to talk about a difficult subject the migrant workers amongst us, the spread of the pandemic amongst them. And he, from the title, he's basically saying, from now on, you will not be alone. It's trying to awaken conscience. Uh, and so using just very, very simple materials, this is a small work, cardstock, paper, wood, enamel. Uh, Faris is able to touch a very deep vein. It's as, as tall as a building, it's, it's as wide as mercy. Next slide, please. So history, um, history lesson Indonesia is a room sized installation of eight desks and a blackboard by Suti Kunavichayanon from Thailand. Uh, Suti is thinking about how history is written and taught actually in this work. So he carved difficult periods in the history of Indonesia onto student desks. Uh, these events are actually not in the history books of Indonesia any anymore. They are not taught in school. And the work is activated by putting a blank piece of paper on top of the uh, desk and then to do a charcoal rubbing. In, in effect, what was hidden and you know, uh, hidden away appears. So what, what was for, forgotten is remembered. Next slide, please. Bridge. So on the left, you have Spot 
the robot dog from Boston Dynamics. In the middle, you have a carving from the, the Ifugao tribe of the Philippine North. It's a rice guardian, which they call the Bulul. And on the, on the right is the work Eidolon by Gary Ross Pastrana from the Philippines. Gary commissioned basically sculptors from the Ifugao to render spot the robot dog as if it were a tribal guardian. All right, same wood, same style. Uh, in this way, Gary is making a bridge between the distant past and the far future. He is asking questions about technology, about mythology, and about what we worship before and what we worship now. So for us, we have a, a deep interest in this, and we, we always like watching the sacred becoming profane and the profane becoming sacred. Uh, next slide, please. So Elegy. Uh, the first film that was ever made is A Horse in Motion by Edward Muybridge. And in the age of digital film, in the age of digital streaming, in the age of universal ownership of film libraries through Netflix, this way of filmmaking is passing. It's, in fact, it has passed. So Trojan Horse is a work by Kawayan Digia from the Philippines. Trojan Horse is made out of celluloid trumpets and is the size of an actual horse. Kawayan's father is the famous filmmaker, Kidlat Tahimik. So in Trojan Horse, Kawayan is basically recognizing the passing of an age. Uh, celluloid, you know, recording film on film, lost traditions like making New Year trumpets made out of discarded film, and also a son coming to grips with a father that, who is growing old. So it's the passing of a generation as well. So in a way, we, we see this work as uh, something around generations, around mortality. And I thought it was poetic because it's it's the last horse of film saluting the first horse of film. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This is my, my, my last slide, guys. Thanks for, for listening. W Waterfall 3 uh, is a work by Don Ang from Singapore. It's a video record of a 60 kilogram block of paint that was frozen at minus 18 degrees and then slowly melted at room temperature. And it's recorded, it's a compressed recording, obviously, but it basically melts over 18 to 24 hours. And the work is about changing states of matter from solid, liquid, and air or gas. But it also evokes long time or deep time, you know, glacial time, ecological time. And, and it speaks to the decay that is in everything. People always ask me, uh, why do you collect? Why do you, you and your wife collect, right? And let me, I started with a story of Spider-Man. Let me end with another story. In 1997, uh, when Hong Kong was going back to China, uh, the composer Tan Dun was actually asked to write a symphony. It became Symphony 1997. The, the CD cover is here. Uh, in this symphony, 2,500-year-old bells from the tomb of the Marquis of Yi were used. These bells are remarkable because they are the earliest representation of tonal music. They can produce notes. So 2,500 years old tonal music. At the exhibition where these bells were displayed, uh, one of the visitors, upon learning of their tonal qualities, surprised the museum guards, and they started shouting, long live music! Long live music. So this, this visitor turned out to be the tenor, the late tenor, Luciano Pavarotti, right? And so these bells were made by an artist in antiquity, but they were also collected in antiquity. Why do, why do collectors collect, right? Why do collectors collect? Because someday a stranger might come, look upon these works and shout, Long live music, long live art. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Okay, that was a, we've just seen like a lot of uh, uh, really wonderful work. Um, and I mean, from the looks of it, it looks like uh, all of you are collectors in, in some way, um, our panelists, um, and that you all caught the visual bug very early on. So lucky for us, because now we have your works and your collections to appreciate. So thank you. Um, I think we've got a lot to talk about and we actually don't have that much time. Um, it's a really broad topic. Um, and I definitely wanna go into some of the themes that you mentioned, um, but I thought because the panel is literally called Off the Wall, 
uh, I'm assuming that that's the kind of work that most of our attendees are interested in. Um, so I'd like to ask our, our artists first um, about, about your process. Being like cross-disciplinary artists working across mediums, at which point do you decide to break from more like conventional forms during the creative process? Is it something that's conceptualized from the get-go or does that evolve like much later? Um, I'll get Jeanette and, and Jackson to answer that first. All right, shall I go first? <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the job hazards of uh, being design trained and um, being a practicing visual artist is that I always think of my work as a product as well. So, you know, as I was first getting into visual arts or uh, uh, starting my visual arts practice, I asked my friend, my research collaborator, Hazel, and I asked her, hey, you know, when you guys paint, <laughs> now it sounds very ridiculous, but hey, when you guys paint, do you consider the back of the work? Is it finished? You know, what's the finishing like and stuff like that? She was like, oh no, you know, that's not a consideration. And I was flabbergasted because to me, it is always a product and everything has to look nice from all angles. So if you see my last series of works, um, through your heels, um, you know, I took it off the wall just so that we could all look at it all around. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah, but it, it was planted by that seed, uh, in, uh, that the seed was planted um, in that conversation that I had with Hazel. Jackson? Well, I guess for us is uh, we, we never really like, um, was so focused on whether it's a sculpture or whether it's a painting on the wall, you know. Uh, you know, we were just happy to put our, our thoughts or our voice on anything, you know, visually on anything. It can be on a sneaker, it can be on a, you know, a sticker, it can be on a cap, it can be on a, it can be a zine, you know, it can be a, you know, it can be a poster, you know, it, it doesn't matter, you know, as long as we can get something out, you know, express ourselves uh, and have fun. I think that's very much what Fung does. Um, Michael, I mean, as, as someone who's been collecting for several years now, as we've seen, um, I mean, you clearly have certain themes that run through your work. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, specific to this, um, at this stage that you're at now for collecting art, do you, does it matter that the artists that you collect that are breaking convention, that they go off the walls, so to speak? Yeah, um, I think the, the there are two ways to answer that. I think good work, regardless of the medium, will always speak to a collector. You know, really great work will always connect, regardless of where it's at. But uh, there is some truth with what you say, Tracy, because uh, after you, you've uh, uh, assembled a bit of a collection and you, you made your first venture in, into non-painting, non uh, it, it can be addictive, right? And you start to look for those very, very interesting things. I think there are metaphors that can't be created other than in other material. If, if I think of Felix Gonzalez Torres and his ode to his lover, where it's basically candies on the floor and you are meant to uh, eat them and discard them, talking about the AIDS epidemic at that time, you know, it can, can't be done in, in a painting. You can paint some an AIDS someone uh, dying of age, uh, but that is a, 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 just a different idiom. Um, so very recently, or for a couple of years ago, we, we started a collection on, on video, and video has all these um, difficulties. There's technical, um, there's also the issue of ethics, you know, it's easily copyable, right? It's easily replicated. Uh, and there's also the issue of uh, repurposing because uh, video artists like to use segments of some of their art work into another work, which becomes a new, a new art piece. So, but we like being part of that conversation of trying to push the boundaries of what's, what's uh, acceptable and what, what, sh what people should do. And I think, uh, you know, off the walls, at some point you do run out of walls. So, you know, having other, other material, looking at other materials also, it's also important. True. Um, I think that, yeah, that's a good question that kind of brings us to, to the marketplace. And I mean, what it still looks like um, is that things are, art collecting is still very object centric, right? Um, and as, as artists creating, when you're working towards a show where your work will be sold, <clears throat> sorry, how present is your buying audience? You know, <clears throat> so sorry. <clears throat> you know, are you thinking of specific collectors you know, does the practicality of where your work is going to end up, like, is it a guide or, or is it a hindrance? 
to your creativity. Uh, we can have like Jeanette or Jackson to, to answer that one. Um, for me, again, because I'm a designer, it always kinds of see, kind of seeps into my um, practice. Um, will it be hung? Will it be sitting? And how low should it be sitting? And how high? All of these things, um, you know, um, always uh, kind of like hinders me in my creative process. But I think uh, that's really useful um, in thinking um, empathetically uh, about from the uh, bias point of view. You know, I don't want to create a work that is unhangable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, maybe that's not the right thing to, to do, but um, because I'm such a designer that is almost virtually impossible to separate that part of me from my creating of uh, art. <laughs> yeah, I think from, from, from us as well, I think because we, we share the same kind of design so-called training with uh, Jeanette. So obviously we are always mindful of what so-called the audience is and who is the person who's gonna, who's gonna collect this work or you know, how are they gonna to show, show it, you know. But at the same time, uh, but sometimes when we are creating the work itself, it takes us to different places because in design, you kind of like uh, set your mind to do something and you, you produce it, you know. But in art, sometimes the, the, in the process of producing, you will bring you to another thing. So sometimes the, the work became bigger or it became harder to so-called collect or harder to hang. But uh, eventually you always find a way to be, you know, for the collectors to be able to bring them home like, or bring them to the museums. Yeah. Okay, um, I was thinking about, uh, in, for, for Michael, uh, Mike, he had the, this idea about dialogue, you know, and it, sometimes it's serendipitous that, that it happens. But I wondered, um, you know, how important is it for any new potential piece to relate to the work that you already have? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And it's very important at, at this point. I think um, uh, there, there, so my, my wife is actually the strongest curator of our, of our collection. Uh, and, um, you know, she, she has surpassed me in how she studies and really thinks about the collection. But there is a hidden, curator in the collection as well, which is the other works. Because at some point, you, you are right, uh, because you are building certain themes, you're building certain uh, uh, conversations, it's important that something new that you acquire uh, works well with what you already have. The, se the second thing is really around coming back to the ge geography lens. There are gaps in the collection. So if you want to build a, a Southeast Asian collection, for example, if, if you want to build a, a video collection, there are segments, there are very important video work out there that, you know, uh, we as collectors would be looking for. Um, or there are gaps, for example, Laos. Laos is a, a country in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, that is not yet in our collection. So in those segments, they those themes may not directly speak to the rest of the collection, but they would find a place by, by virtue of being a completist, but it's very, very important that basically the, the existing artwork agrees with whatever new thing you bring into it. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about um, this idea of updating work, because I think, you know, Jackson, uh, you mentioned that um, I, I think you're doing, you've updated the work Control Chaos already, and I think you also have a, an app that's kind of coming out. And I just, you know, I thought about you know, um, I think it's wonderful that you're able to use the latest available technology to do that. It's not, it wasn't possible in the past. Um, and do you think that this was a, is a way to stay, in, you know, relevant to new audiences? Why do you think it's important? Yeah, I think it's really interesting for Funk, you know, after, you know, after so many years to come back to relook at Control Chaos and update it. And we realized that, you know, uh, actually nowadays you have the tools and you have the medium to be able to do that. Uh, you know, back in the days, uh, you don't have digital tools, you know, let's say you paint, it's very hard to update your work if it's a painting or a sculpture, you know, whereas now there's a lot of digital means to do that. At the same time, there's now there's social media and there's the internet, you know, to be able to, to or digital means to show it. So you don't really need a physical space sometimes to show an update of a work, yeah. So I think that's really mm -hmm. interesting because it's almost like your Facebook or your, your uh, Instagram status, you can update it every, every second or every day. And we feel that 
actually now looking at it, you know, it's, it is possible for artists to be able to, able to update your works uh, constantly. So you don't always have to stick to one piece of work. But I think, of course, that would be crazy for collectors. They would think, what the hell, you know, <laughs> you're constantly updating your works. But, but think about it, your Spider-Man is always, always constantly updated as well. You know, we are seeing different versions of Spider-Man along the way. So the story goes on. You know, there's something that's constant and something that is ongoing as well. But I guess the question would be then, how does this affect, um, you know, the question of like provenance, right? Which is so important uh, in the art world, you know, how it adds value to work, just, you know, like how it's traded, where, where it came from, where it ended up in. Uh, I think this would be especially challenging uh, with digital work. Um, do you think that's going to impact on the kind of value that that kind of work can, can generate? Uh, anyone can answer this one. Don't be shy. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll take a stab at it, uh, being the collector on the panel. I think provenance is extremely important. Um, you know, w without that provenance, and, and we, we often actually buy primary, meaning we buy it from the gallery. We, we hardly buy it from auction, actually, almost never. And so the idea of provenance, and that's one of the advantages of contemporary art. You're, you're collecting the art of your contemporaries. They are alive, they are making, and they, you can attend their shows. And uh, the idea of uh, the, the, the problem of provenance is not so, it's not so important, right? Because you can affirm it at the show itself. The, the issue is that when you start escalating the, the values and you are at auction and you know there there is there are so many ways to replicate artwork nowadays then this idea of provenance is extremely important um, so i think it is related to value and, and it's related to time when you bought it are you the first or the second collector and how much are you paying for it so if, i like the fact that you, if you're buying a very expensive piece of work it's like jumping out of a without provenance, it's like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, you know, you can skydive. And for a few short minutes, you're really free fall falling and it's wonderful, but what if it's fake? So, so I think that's important. Now, in terms of validation, and maybe to bring in my artist, uh, artist colleagues here, is provenance so important in terms of validation? Not, not as much. So I'm speaking about this, not the value income, or the, the value, but the psychic income that a work gives. If you love it and it's giving you joy every day, who cares where, where it came from, right? It's, it's part of you and it's giving you energy. Um, and I think artists have a very, very different idea about provenance. Okay, so I'm, so I'm concerned about the time. So I think um, we, we had an important question to uh, answer because uh, it, was in, it was in the write-up, right? And it was really like how we can kind of support uh, more of this type of work. And I mean, on a personal note, I, I guess I come from the world of like, you know, creating experiences for brands. And, uh, you know, I feel that that kind of pace, you know, is, is so much quicker than what it seems to me as someone from the outside of the art world, that it seems like things are, it's almost traditional in some ways, you know, how art is bought and sold I mean, even with art fairs. And I wonder if you agree with me and if you see things changing. And I guess from the artist's point of view, like what more can we do or can, or like see focus and, and art fairs, what more can they do to support um, this type of work? A lot of questions there. Yeah, can I start? Maybe I can start and then uh, hand over to my co-panelists. Um, I think the pandemic created uh, a and there was a panel talk on this on the future of art fairs right but i think c focus has created a great opportunity to use the technology uh, to create different experiences for example visiting artists in their studio visiting collectors in their home uh, things that someone would not normally see have been revealed as a result of the pandemic, that people are more willing. And I think that's the first clue of how uh, these types of platforms can push alternative art uh, and art that's trying to use uh, or to push the, the envelope, which, which is to show collectors who have collected that work and to put it out. I think tonight 
the, the, the C focus spotlight will end with the Rubels, you know, and the Rubels are the, the one, some of the greatest collectors in the world. And they are uh, entirely now in new media and installation and so on and so forth. So the more that people see um, crazy folks like myself who've been able, who live with this kind of art, who put it there, I think it, it, it can open open a pathway for people. So showcasing, I think, is one very powerful way to do that. I, I agree, you know, I really enjoyed the videos of the um, studio visits of the artists um, in C-Focus, um, the EDMs. So, um, and I think um, likewise, the pandemic allowed, um, uh, open up this chance for younger and, you know, millennial artists to be featured. And a lot of their art is very risk-taking um in terms of media and presentation so i think uh you know uh, to continue doing that and uh, kudos <laughs> yep. i think that the, the artists will always surprise the world you know um and now it's like a you know, banana with a stick with a, with a tape on it you know and anything can be a heart you know and and you know the idea of artists uh you know making work just for collection uh i don't think there's the whole picture of it you know it, it is the art market but i think artists has a primary uh so-called need to be able to express themselves uh, through various mediums and i think of course artists also uh, needs to be supported by the collectors in order to you know to make the work that they do uh and i think there is a, a, a part of it where you know, certain works can be collected and you know certain works it, it will be very hard to be collected you know, but it's part and parcel of being an artist uh, i don't think we can do everything that's 100 percent like so-called catering to a collector to collect yeah. okay um i mean this is the time that we're, we're meant to, to put aside for for q a um so i will ask the questions that are in uh, the chat um, box and if you have, uh, if anyone else has questions, uh, please add them in here now. If not, I get to ask more questions. Um, but uh, there's one here um, to, to Mike actually, is how differently do you regard your collections of artwork versus other collectibles like uh, your comic books? And is one more important than the other or do you see them all as a single collection? Mike, did you get that? The, the yeah, I got that. Uh, they, they are separate. Uh, that's a very easy question to answer. They are separate. Uh, a collection, be it art, be it books, be it wine, be it stamps, be it uh, video games, a collection uh, is something to be shared, actually. It, it, it is also, it has a communal com community dimension. So the, the folks that I share contemporary art interests with are very different from the folks that I share my comic book interests with. So by definition, the collections will, will be separate uh, and because the people I talk to them about are separate. Thank you. Um, so during this, dis the, during, this is another question from Ayiha. During this disrupted time, how would you continue to find inspiration for your new creations? I think the artist can uh, answer this one. me um, i i think um finding inspiration is such a i don't know it's such a difficult question you know uh, gary larson once <laughs> said that i think he said it, he detested this question because it's, it's so hard to answer that he found inspiration under the couch and you know all over but you know as as um, a person who consumes many forms of art um, i think uh, um, that approach allows me to have a very wide visual vocabulary and being constantly interested in uh, current affairs that is my source for uh, inspiration i think for us the this this um, the last year has been you know so called people saying like uh, it's unprecedented and uh, it is and it's a it's so so big that it's a global um uh, story and everybody shares that memory of it and that somehow becomes a very powerful, um, you know, powerful um, story for us to tell uh, through control chaos. Um, so sometimes the inspiration is not from, from, you know, the usual things that we consume, but it's also from what is happening around us in the world. And last year was something that's so impactful that, you know, it has to be on the works. Yeah, 
actually what happened last year also impacted the way I made my work. So I had no choice but to bring my studio into my tiny home. And, you know, because I work with yarn and a lot of uh, fibers, it was all very dusty. And I had to always pack it up every night into duffel bags and Ikea bags, then stuff it in my storeroom. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be out in the balcony doing work. And, you know, so, it, but that also, you know, came um, to me uh, as an as also inspiration because then I thought about creating space for myself um, in, 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 in my house. And, and then I thought about the women um, uh, um, outside um, uh, in the world and how they created space for themselves in this pandemic. Um, okay, last question from the Q&A at the moment is to the artist, do you collect yourself and what do you collect and why? I actually asked them this before as well, so. <laughs> Um, some of the things I collect uh, are tiny skulls, human skulls. <laughs> I, don't, I have this morbid fascination of realistic looking skulls. I have them in like wax and then plastic and erasers as well. <laughs> and I have a, collect, a whole slew of them. And I used to collect a lot of albums, uh, vinyls. I still have vinyls, but you know, um, of the artists I like, like B-sides and stuff like that. And a lot of zines from all over the world when I was a punk kid. Yeah, so those were the uh, my precious things. Yeah, I think for me, uh, you know, personally, I collect a lot of like vinyl records as well, like uh, Jeanette, and uh, also um, I have a lot of comic books like Mike. I, even though I don't have a Spider Man, uh, you know, first experience, you know, I would love to have that. Uh, and uh, I also have a small collection of art myself, of artists that I admire and uh, you know that I've liked since uh, I was in school, you know. Okay, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, there was one question that I wanted to ask, um, uh, which I didn't just now, and it was about um, relics, right? And because Jeanette as well, you know, trying to capture these live performances, these gigs, um, you know, that are so visceral in the moment and, and all you can capture after that. So would you say that a, a relic that captures a visceral live moment, um, like, or how well it does, is that what makes good art? I don't know if that's what makes good art. Because <laughs> I'm coming from the perspective of a performer, right? If I'm playing in my band, that that moment, and, and when I'm caught up in my, okay, like, let's pretend I do a bass solo, okay? I don't do bass solos. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, blah, 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 whatever. You know, I don't think that visceral kind of like raw energy is transmitted as well in a performance, uh, sorry, in a, a recording of a performance. Or if, for example, if I sold my bass and then somebody says, wow, this is the bass that <laughs> Janet did that <laughs> amazing solo. I don't, um, I, I will find this a bit far removed because as a musician, it, the connection is just a bit hard to piece together. Yeah. I, however, I must say that when I went to uh, Choi Ka Fai's um, Cosmic Wanderer um, uh, exhibition. I was quite in the moment. <laughs> there were all these screens around and the sound system was amazing. And what's fascinating was that the screens had different perspectives of that uh, ritualistic dance uh, documentation. So, you know, that was perhaps as close as possible as one can get to a performance. Yeah, I mean, I really question, yeah, how can you really capture that moment? I'm excited because I'm going for that right after we, we finish this. Uh, Michael, do you want to, uh, Mike, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, I think I we've come to the point where we, we understand that the, these are, in a way, separate artworks. Uh, and there there's the, the idea of intent as well, right? The, if we... <laughs> Not to bore everybody, but if you think about an economic model of a performance, you sell tickets and people go to the performance and that's how uh, the artist is able to monetize that experience. But how do you do that for a performance artist where they are doing it inside a museum setting that didn't charge any, you know? So there is an economic model that has to emerge from that. It is not the same though, as having attended the performance. But as I said, uh, similar to the idea of relics, where the saint is venerated, but somehow the saint's relics are also equally venerated. In an economic sense, the performance then gains a new life as a different art form, perhaps a video recording, the relics of that show. And like Jeanette said, you know, people do buy 
the guitars of the Rolling Stones that they played in Havana during this, or David Bowie's costume that he wore at the, at the concert just before the Berlin Wall fell, those are relics of a certain kind of performance that actually gains its own uh, impetus, it gains its own identity apart from the original, but it's not, I personally believe it's not, as Jeanette said, it's not the same as the actual performance. All right, and with that, we have come to the time to end the panel. We thought, actually, speaking of veneration, and we talked about that, can we see that Spider-Man comic? Mike, do you have it with you? Oh. I think it <laughs> will. <laughs> <laughs> I think his video is a bit lagged. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it? No, not yet. Oh, yeah. No? <laughs> I think the no. delay, there's a delay. It is? Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Something's wrong with my connection. <laughs> oh, I do have yeah. it in my hand. Okay. Oh, yeah, well. But if you do have it in hand, then do you really have it? There's <laughs> 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 a delayed recording of your hand holding it. Okay, thank you. I think I'll hand back over to uh, the C-Focus team. Uh, thanks to everyone that listened in, contributed questions. Um, yeah, and uh, we're enthusiastic. Thank thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much again, Jeanette, Mike, Jackson, and Tracy um, for your time and for your very spirited discussion today. Um, so coming up next, as Mike has reminded us during the talk, is our final talk of the Sea Spotlight Talk series. And this is a special segment with the renowned art collectors Don and Mara Rubel. And this is happening at 8 p.m. today, and they'll be speaking live to us from Miami. We will get a peek into you know, their vast collection and also learn more about their collecting journey, motivations, and values. So for more information and updates on our talks and on Sea Focus, please visit our website, cfocus.sg and also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Once again, thank you all, take care and have a wonderful day ahead. <laughs>